Uh, Professor Berg, happy to see you. Uh, our team has prepared a uh, few questions about the recent Nagorno-Karabakh war and its outcomes. It, I hope our, our analysis, our conversation uh, will be interesting for uh, general audience. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask about the outbreak of the war or resumption of hostilities as some claim point to, to the fact that the conflict had never been over before September 27th. Looking from outside as, an, um, as a foreign expert, what seems as the key reasons uh, that triggered the Second Karabakh War? Systematic failure of the neg negotiation process, Nikol Pashin Pashinyan's populist rhetoric uh, for the past two and a half years, or domestic motivations in either of the belligerent parties? Well, there can be many different reasons uh, to, um, to emphasize here. But first of all, I would like to, to say that, um, as you correctly pointed out, uh, we, do, we had a ceasefire agreement since 1994, but uh, during the last 26 years, the situation was more like uh, uh, no war, no peace. Uh, so the, the, there was a, a frequent exchange of fire across uh, the line of contact. Uh, there were uh, deadly incidents every day. Uh, so uh, basically what happened on the 27th of September was not a surprise at all. So it was not a question why uh, the, the war started then. It was, it was simply the question uh, um, it was simply the question uh, uh, when, when exactly the war was supposed to start because uh, both sides, both Armenia and Azerbaijan were, were ready for that. So they were clearly preparing for the war. Uh, Azerbaijan was, um, was in the position to claim back the lost territories. So we know that, um, especially during the recent years, uh, Azerbaijani de uh, defense budget was almost as big as the Armenian uh, state budget. So there was a lot of military spending on the Azerbaijani side. So Azerbaijan tried to equip itself with the most uh, modern te uh, military technology and, uh, and prepared for the war. Uh, at the same time, uh, one shouldn't be also surprised that, that Armenia uh, somehow was also uh, ready for war uh, because uh, there has been also some hotheads uh, in, in Armenia who still uh, were in a position that, that although they won the war in, uh, the first Karabakh war in 1994, that was not the full victory. So there was there was still some some lands they claimed, and and so they were simply uh, waiting for the moment, even being ready to provoke, to the extent that the war can start. So um, in that respect. Uh, it was not the question why the war started, but, but just uh, when, when it war, was the right moment to start the, the war again. Then secondly, um, it, it is important to mention that uh, there was a regime change in Armenia 2018. So Nikol Pashinyan uh, came the power and uh, the first thing he wanted to assure is that he's going to lose Karabakh uh, because as we we'll probably also know uh, the, the previous Armenian political elite had very close connections to Karabakh. Uh, the previous presidents, Kocharyan, Salxian, they, they came from Karabakh. They, they were war veterans. Uh, they had uh, their political career starting in Karabakh before they moved to Armenian politics. So when Pashinyan came to power, then everything changed immediately. And at the same time, 
he now had to to prove that he's not going to abandon or somehow to to forget everything that was achieved during the previous times so he needed to to uh, gain more legitimacy uh, from from karma and that made him to to do things as going to Stepanakert and proclaiming that that Karabakh is Armenia or or also uh, there were also the, the elections to to de facto state of uh, institutions to them. The new president of Nagorno Karabakh was elected in in May 2020, and one of the first things they they started to to plan was to how to relocate the, the parliament from uh, Stepanak to Sushi. So. Uh, these were definitely provocative elements. So I would say that, that um, seeing from the, from the uh, side of domestic politics, uh, Armenian side uh, made some steps that were not necessary and that definitely uh, were used by Azerbaijan because they, uh, they, they took it uh, in, uh, explicitly as, as very provocative steps. Now, as to the external factors, then uh, it seems to be uh, that, that also the, the pandemic, the worldwide pandemic uh, affected a lot because many uh, uh, great powers were heavily engaged with fighting against of COVID-19 uh, also, presidential elections in the U.S. had a relatively decisive element because U.S. was completely out of, of the region. Uh, so, which again left uh, free hands to, to Russia and to Turkey. So, in the end of the day, uh, we had a traditional, uh, let's say, traditional um, uh, conflict parties, Armenia, Azerbaijan, clashing against each other, and then having uh, their, they, let's say, uh, patron states like Russia and Turkey to, to in, play an important role. So, in the end of the day, uh, no other players uh, had any access or interest to, to engage in, in this new war. I see. Yeah. Professor Berg, during and even after the war, the Republic of Armenia leadership, as well as the Armenians abroad, called uh, on the international community to recognize the separatist regime installed in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, usually based on remedial secession. So several questions um, uh, uh, arise in my, in my head uh, in this regard. To what extent can remedial secession be applied in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, both theoretically and practically. Why has the Republic of Armenia itself never recognized uh, the so-called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, both during and uh, be before and during the war? Uh, the third question um, uh, in this context, the French parliament recently adopted a resolution that advises uh, its government to recognize the entity. Uh, may France or any other power uh, step in to do so, to recognize uh, the, the Nagorno-Karabakh regime? Okay, you have already three questions. But, uh, let, me, let me just start um, by um, somehow framing the whole war, because um, in my reading there were uh, different interpretations uh, what is going on, why, why there is a war after all. And it's interesting to see how, how different these interpretations were. For instance, uh, on Armenian side, they had uh, two interpretations. So Armenian discourse basically uh, was trying to say that what is going on is basically the, the, the war against international terrorists. Why they, they build it on this? Because on the one hand, uh, it was clear that there were um, 
mercenaries from Syria. These mercenaries were taken to, to the front line by Turkey. Uh, whether these mercenaries were a part of the, the jihadist groups uh, or not, I, I, I can't tell you exactly. But the fact is that there were, there were mercenaries taken from Syria and then Armenian side can, could easily claim that these are international terrorists. So Armenian side wanted to make the, the, the war look like a kind of international uh, type of uh, warfare. So wanted to make it global, basically, so that it is not simply a war between two countries, but there are also, it has a regional dimension and also a very clear connection to international terrorists. And international terrorism, obviously, is something that is not tolerated by the international community. Secondly, also, Armen Armenian side wanted to, to um, uh, uh, emphasize the, the, the possibility of genocide to zero. Uh, with reference to, to, to a 1915 genocidal practices in Turkey and now saying that what, what we have right now is basically uh, revisiting the past atrocities and, and this is going to end as a genocide again. And, and probably also the very idea of, of using that discourse was to gain more international attention and to make the whole war uh, a bit more uh, kind of global uh, in, in, in substance so that it is again not a kind of issue between two countries which uh, simply do not find a common language. Uh, seeing from the Azerbaijani side, that was definitely a defense war because uh, for Azerbaijan, uh, simply the war was um, uh, unfreezed uh, from 1994 when there was a ceasefire agreement. Uh, so it was just a temporary uh, act and now it was just unfreezed. Uh, and and uh, Azerbaijan was on a position of defense for to claim back the lost territories. Now, getting to your, your question about uh, uh, remedial secession, uh, well, it may have a point if, let's say, um, if, if Armenian side uh, approves somehow that the, the, the crimes were committed against humanity, that the war itself produced a lot of war crimes. And, and there is no way that Armenian population can uh, coexist together with Azerbaijanis. Uh, so if, if uh, let's say, as you probably also are aware, uh, uh, there are, there's Amnesty International, which is now trying to to uh, find out the, the, the war crimes committed by both sides, not only Azerbaijanis, but also Armenians, and, and also against of, uh, prisoners of war, and, and also civilians. And, uh, and uh, so the, the, there can be, uh, let's say, uh, deeply rooted uh, belief or perception that, that simply these, these communities are not capable. They're not able to, to, to coexist. And the only way for Armenian uh, minority is to secede. So now the question is whether this kind of discourse finds also reception or acceptance by, by international community. And in order to find that, there can be, let's say, two kinds of activities. One is uh, using, uh, let's say, kind of international intervention, uh, we may call it even peace enforcement on the territory of, of Nagorno-Karabakh, so, so that the, the, the remaining Armenian populated territories in Karabakh will be, um, uh, let's say, uh, protected by the by the international force 
so we see already that Russian peacekeepers have uh, uh, took the positions in, in, in the remaining Republic of Karabakh, which is not under the control of Azerbaijan at, at the moment. And, and uh, so they may play this, this role of enforcing the peace and also conserving the situation, which means that the whole situation will be frozen again. There, there will be no change for a for time being. And, uh, and at the same time, um, well, time will tell whether, whether the, the second element will be activated and second element will be then the recognition from the rest of the world. Uh, so that one could easily say that this remedial succession has been activated. And, and uh, in this way, the Nakhoda Karabakh can, can gain international recognition. Now, um, you also mentioned the, the side of the international community, what would be their position and how do they uh, see the whole situation evolving. So, despite of the fact that there have been many uh, sub-state units either talking about uh, different U.S. states or, or, um, or some regional districts, townships, which have actually uh, recognized the independence of the Karabakh Republic, it doesn't matter in, in a broader picture. Even the fact that, that the French Senate uh, decided to recognize, or at least uh, made recommendation to the to the to the French government to 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 recognize uh, the independence of Nagorno Karabakh. This is not binding, and I'm 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 quite convinced that that France is not going to to recognize uh, this entity. Armenia is also not going to do that. Uh, Armenia has never done it, although there has been some voices and some calls to do it, but Armenia has not done it because uh, for Armenia it was important to, to show that, that uh, Armenia is not the party to the conflict and, and this is the Karnagarabakh. So although uh, Armenia has always been very supportive, uh, not only military speaking but also economically and politically, and, and while recognizing the, the independence of, of um, self-proclaimed republic, uh, then that automatically could actually uh, mean many things. Uh, it can also mean, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sooner or later a kind of uh, reunification or unification with, with Armenia. So, uh, um, as I mentioned already before, this has not been the Armenian interest. So Armenia does not want to, to, to uh, take this position as, as being uh, directly involved in, in the conflict and to, to leave this, this conflict on the side of the nagorno karabakh Armenian community. So this is briefly the explanation, but, but once again, one, one shouldn't rule out, uh, let's say, the situation where, on the one hand, let's say, uh, the whole war and the, the outcome of the war may have a, a wider impact than one could actually have expected. For instance, uh, uh, given that, that Turkey was heavily involved and, and largely Azerbaijan won this war because of the Turkish military assistance, because of the, the Bayraktar uh, drones, which were uh, incredibly good and efficient in this war. And, uh, and uh, um, because of that, let's say, this, this, this support from the brotherly country uh, Baku may actually decide to recognize the independence of the Northern Cyprus. Uh, 
it is it hasn't been ruled out at all uh, and and maybe baku has now a stronger position to to do that move uh, and that would be definitely in the, in the interest of Ankara as well. So if this is going to happen, then that may again trigger uh, a situation where Republic of Cyprus may, for instance, recognize the independence of Magogna. And there can, there can be also all sorts of, you know, small countries, insignificant, taking, uh, let's say, some examples from uh, from Oceania or, or some other, you know, smaller units which probably can be uh, uh, can be easily convinced or or, or to 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 recognize the independence of Karabakh uh, for for the sake of let's say uh, or to receiving some economic contracts in return. So this is quite a well known practice and, and many. Many, many countries have, have used that in the past. So I wouldn't entirely rule out, but, but at the moment, uh, it seems that, that the current situation as it is, we do have, a, um, let's say, Nagorno Karabakh Republic, which is, which is only, let's say, 30% uh, of what it had before. This entity has, uh, let's say, Russian peacekeepers. Uh, it has become a, more like a Russian protectorate. I would even call that Russia is a new patron state and it is not Armenia any longer. So for with Armenia, there is only, let's say, kinship ties and, and this kind of connections, but but Russia is, is playing the first hand in, in this game at the moment, uh, protecting militarily, providing security of, of the remaining uh, Karabakh Armenians. And given that, that uh, about 100,000 uh, Karabakh Armenians escaped and only 40,000 have remained in this Russian protected territory, then the issue of, let's say, viability, the issue of uh, sustainability and, and everything which can be considered as vital elements for the, for the independence or, or statehood, they are right now very much under the question. So uh, if Nagorno-Karabakh had some kind of de facto statehood in the past, now this is more and more questionable at the moment. And that can be also the important thing that the countries which were probably in the past willing to recognize, they now think twice before they do that move. Uh, Professor Berg, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it, was, it was one of the uh, questions uh, we had prepared before the interview, because scholarly literature uh, usually refer to the uh, regime uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh as a de facto state. Uh, so I was about to ask you to characterize uh, the, the nature of the entity or what, e what um, is left out of it, uh, although it may be too early to draw some conclusions. So you, you covered that part. Thank you very much. Um, Nagorno-Karabakh has always been uh, a unique case among the uh, post-Soviet uh, frozen conflicts because it it had never been frozen actually uh, plus there there uh, it, there had been no contact no dialogue between uh, the uh, two communities unlike uh, other other uh, flashpoints uh, across the post-soviet area another unique element uh, was uh, was the absence uh, of direct Russian involvement on the ground but things changed uh, after the uh, 10th of November uh, peace deal. Do you think the uh, existence of Russian troops in Nagorno-Karabakh will make it similar to other cases in post-Soviet space? After all, the established entities in, in Georgia, Ukraine, or Moldova uh, are either recognized or sympathized with by, by Russia. But the situation with what has left um, of the so-called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic is, is quite unclear. So 
uh, how could you characterize the Russian position towards the re this region, this breakaway territory, the, uh, to this conflict in general? Um, well, what we know is that the Russian troops are there, so um, they are deployed there. Uh, they control the, the security field. Uh, they provide uh, yeah, military assistance and, and security for the remaining Armenian uh, population. Uh, in many ways, the situation is similar, but, but there is also a clear difference. I, I don't think that, that Russia somehow is now going to, to recognize the independence of Nagorno Karabakh like it happened in the case of South Ossetia or, or Abkhazia. I also um, uh, don't think that that uh, uh, Russia's position will be similar to to the, the situation in, in Transnistria. Uh, what is going to happen there? Probably, I think that the first goal for for Russia would be to to get uh, back as many as possible these refugees from Armenian Karabakh, Armenian refugees to, to return their homes because the only way they can justify their presence as a peacekeeping force is just because of, of, of providing protection to the civilians. But if you don't have enough civilians, then the question may arise why there's a peacekeeping force after all. So I think this is the, the first important thing that the Russian peacekeepers try to do and Russia as a country is trying to convince those who, who fled. Um, and, and when at the same time, uh, definitely Russia is interested in, in having the, the feet on the ground to, to have the military presence there because after all, okay, Azerbaijan won the war but at the same time, one of the winners was also Russia because Russia popped in just out of the southern and, and as, as probably uh, giving the impression that their intervention was decisive to, to finish the war. And, and they were the ones who actually uh, brought peace. So uh, Russia is also very well, very much aware that uh, if it doesn't manage to to um, stay there to pro provide its 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 presence, then it will be taken over by Turkey, or or let's say the Russia's influence is going to diminish uh, in in the South Caucasus uh, because Georgia is very much gone already. Uh, Azerbaijan is very much standing alone and, and having a very strong Turkish connection. Uh, Armenia has left the only country, but, but this is not probably enough. So Russia, Russia wants to, to keep its, its uh, presence there. And, uh, and now the, the crucial thing is the number of, of people uh, who, who stay in Karabakh. And, and the number of, of those who they are supposed to protect. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Berg, for sharing your valuable thoughts uh, with us.